this first panel, Tectonic Shifts in Money and Power, we're going to talk a lot about the theme of de-dollarization, bolting on to the talk that, uh, that we just had, right, about what stage might we be in in history right now in terms of the cycle of empire, where we're at, and what might happen next. Now, a core thread inside this conversation is the subject of de-dollarization, right? The world trending away from dollars as the primary and exclusive uh, world reserve currency in terms of global trade and uh, reserves, right? Financial reserves for countries. Um, as I mentioned during my intro, there's a lot of noise around subjects like this. It's really easy to get super sensational and hyperbolic and confused as a consequence. The gentlemen on stage with me today have been hyper-focused on this subject long before anybody else was talking about it. So I thought they're the best to uh, steer this conversation with me this morning. Um, I want to start with you, Grant. Could you outline uh, the, the subject of de-dollarization for anybody who's not familiar? What is it? Let's start there. Sure. Um, is, is Brent Johnson in a safe space, <laughs> by the way? I know he's in here somewhere. Um, yeah, look, de-dollarization, de it's just, a in its simplest form, it's just moving away from having the dollar as the most dominant currency for trade and for uh, holding reserves. And it's a big argument, and everyone's taken a very firm position on, on, on one side or the other. And actually, you know, Brent um, uh, has become almost the poster boy for this conversation. And, you know, if you listen to what Brent actually says, everybody says that he's the milkshake guy and the dollar is never going away. That's not what Brent says at all. Brent says the dollar's the last one to go away, but it will go away, and he's absolutely right. You know, as, as I think you mentioned in your talk there, Jay, that no reserve currency has lasted. They all ultimately fall into the same traps that the US is falling in now with extending the debts. Um, the important thing is that we're having this conversation, right? De-dollarization would not have been a panel topic two or three years ago. It wouldn't have been something that enough people were interested in or focused on. And so the move is gradual. The move is, is happening. There's no, you can't deny it's happening. There are countries that are looking to diversify away from the dollar. And that has picked up speed since um, the American Treasury uh, froze Russian assets after they invaded Ukraine. Because at that point, this idea that if you're an energy importer or exporter, which is everybody, you have to hold dollar reserves, uh, to have those reserves at the whim of a foreign government, whether you're on the same team at the moment or not, it's not a case of, well, we're not likely to upset the US, they're not likely to freeze our assets. It's a matter of national security. You cannot take that risk because you, we've seen what happened to Russia. So suddenly everybody's actively looking for ways to diversify. And it's incremental. It's not, everyone's not dumping all their treasuries and dumping their dollars. But everyone now, and we saw this the last two years, the, the record volumes of gold buying by central banks to have a neutral reserve asset that that's no government has control of. So it's a process and it's underway. We don't know how long it's going to take. We don't know where the tipping point is, but it's inarguable that the world is looking to de-dollarize now. And that's the important thing. It's a big shift. It's a complete change in how the underpinnings of the financial system work. And we have to be aware of it and we have to think it through. Whichever side you come down on is fine, but you have to understand the world is not how it was three years ago in that you could absolutely rely on the dollar to be where it is indefinitely. So you brought up a, a good distinction there, that there's, there's maybe two ways to think about de-dollarization. One is in terms of global trade, what currency are people using to transact? We're talking about global commodity deals, energy deals, et cetera. And the second is what currency do people save in? And when I say people, I mean central banks and, and countries. And Grant touched on central banks buying records amounts, record amounts of gold. They're buying record amounts of gold instead of US dollars, correct? Yeah, and, and that distinction is probably the most important one between a global reserve currency and a global reserve asset. The currency is what you trade in, the asset is what you hold your reserves in. And at the moment, that's where the change is happening in the asset side. The, the uh, currency side, it's happening here and there, and people are talking about increased use of the yuan and all this kind of stuff and bilateral trade deals and China are giving swap lines, et cetera, et cetera. So it's happening, but the crucial thing to understand at the moment is that it's an asset-based shift right now. Okay, th thank you, Grant. Now, Andy, over to you. So what's at, what's at the root of this? I want to get back to the motivation. Grant mentioned the sanctioning of US dollar reserves from Russia on the heels of that invasion. Super well known. Is there more to it, though? What's motivating? Because the de-dollarization trend began before that. That definitely has amplified the speed of countries uh, decreasing their US dollar holdings and moving towards something else. 
what else is at play that's incentivizing countries right now to hedge their bets and say maybe the US dollar isn't the game it used to be and I might need to think about something else? Yeah, I, I think there's a, term, there's a term that I've become very f uh, fond of and it's called logarithmic decay. <clears throat> and it speaks of a gradual, little by little by little by little by little, chipping away at the dollar hegemony then all at once at some point. Where are we on that scale? But I do think that a lot of it has to do, obviously, with the weaponizing of the dollar. There's no question about that. But the safety in numbers right now, you have a growing chorus of countries that are aligning together and finding safety in numbers in all measurements. And, you know, if you talk about the BRICS, you have two of the three largest nuclear arsenals you have on the planet. You have a greater uh, percentage of global GDP, much greater percentage of, of human population. So it's, it's, it's safety in numbers. And I find it really interesting. There's a man named Jared Bernstein, who is the lead economic advisor of the U.S. government. This is a man with a degree in music and a master's degree in social work, and he is the chief economic advisor to the Biden administration. His entire thesis centers around something called dethrone King Dollar, where he advocates for the immediate uh, release or, or losing the world reserve status, that it's an exorbitant privilege we can no longer afford. And it's interesting, if you look at the motivation behind that, and he's written all sorts of reports on it, picked up in the New York Times and the Washington Post, and the things that we have done, instead of clinging to the world reserve status, we've weaponized the dollar, we coerce, and then, you know, we, we I think, are in, in a place right now where you're, you're finding the world is, is just pushing back against the, the hegemony, pushing back against the coercion, pushing back against the suppression. And um, I don't know, little by little by little, I think that you will see a growing chorus of countries that in and of themselves would never stand up to the West, but are now finding safety with a, a group of countries that represents the majority human population. So, so if I understand logarithmic decay properly, it's little by little by little than a lot, yes. right? It's how'd you go broke slowly then suddenly. This exactly is the, right. Okay, so what we're seeing now from this perspective, therefore, would be a trickle of countries departing US dollar right before some kind of a surge. That yeah, and I think the problem that a lot of people have in, in looking at this is saying, well, it's a nothing burger. Nothing happened in the August meeting, but a lot of things happened in the August meeting with the BRICS. They, they decided to trade in local currencies, and you're seeing, uh, you know, for example, one of the biggest things that I've seen is a country like the United Arab Emirates, the seventh largest oil producing country in the world, an OPEC member, just admitted into BRICS, came out and formally said they're no longer going to take dollars or, for oil. And, you know, so you're beginning to see more, and we, you know, Russia's saying the same thing, Iran's saying the same thing. And so little by little by little by little, you are chipping away at the settlement status of the dollar. And a point you, you and Grant talked about is huge, is that you're seeing all of these countries shed U.S. treasuries, and instead, if you look at the performance of gold since the beginning of, of the century, the S&P's up 7% 7 per year, and gold's up 7.8% per year, and it's obliterated the bond market. So over 25 years, really gold, the tortoise, not the hare, has performed very much like a bond would, and you're not beholden to the United States, you don't have that type of risk, and so these countries are shedding treasuries, they're accumulating gold and finding safety in numbers where they haven't decided to do the all at once moment until there's enough mass adoption in every single way. And I think it's coming to what you were saying about Brent, I, I agree, his milkshake theory is, is fantastic and, and genius, but at some point, a country that's 34 trillion in debt and 150 trillion in unfunded liabilities, at some point that all at once moment happens, but not until they can do it without worrying about the global pushback. Okay, now Matt, Matt, over to you. Um, you, know, you, can't, you can't sell anything without buying something else, right? You can only trade. You wanna sell an equity, you gotta take cash, right? You wanna sell US dollars, you gotta buy something else with that. And so if we're seeing a surge in gold, is this, and I wanna get your perspective on this, is this countries that are saying, we don't know what's gonna happen next, but we feel like something big is happening and gold's the lifeboat. So we're gonna sit there until we know. What's your take on, on what exchange is occurring? Is it US dollars for gold? Is it US dollars for a basket of other currencies? You know, what action are you seeing in terms of central bank swaps like this? Uh, it's an important question as well. I, I was talking to Andy before again about military analogies or military history overlapping with, you know, financial history or central bank policy or monetary policy and, and looking 
to your point, um, you know, Grant's really important is also to keep in mind, keeping this a balanced, not sensational discussion. John Maynard Keynes warned against weaponizing the reserve currency. Robert Triffin, a famous economist, came to the Congress in the 1960s, said, don't go there. Even Barack Obama in 2015 said, don't weaponize. It's going to... It's going to create distrust for this neutral reserve asset. And to your question, well, what do you do if you don't trust the U.S. dollar in the same way because now it's been politicized and weaponized in an aggressive way since the sanctions against Russia? Whatever we or you think of that very debatable war. And I look at it in terms of a military analogy, what are we seeing? Well, we're seeing central banks, especially in the East, stacking physical gold and dumping U.S. treasuries. U.S. treasuries are very related to the U.S. dollar and the Brent Johnson milkshake theory, again, which, for which we all respect and ultimately come to the same conclusions. When I see central banks stacking physical gold at these record levels and dumping U.S. treasuries net at record levels since 2014, to me the analogy is like if you're watching Robert E. Lee march the Army of Northern Virginia from Virginia into Maryland on his way to Antietam or on his way to Gettysburg, you don't need to be a military genius in Pennsylvania or Maryland to see something's coming. It's a shift. It's not the end of the war. It's not even the beginning of the end of the battle, but there's a movement. Farmers, soldiers, scouts, picket lines are saying something's coming. When you see central bankers no longer trusting the U.S. IOU, the U.S. 10-year in particular, and no longer settling at the same levels in U.S. dollars, that's a movement that there's a distrust of this once revered world reserve currency. In fairness to Brent Johnson, to your point, let's also not forget 80% of global trade settlements are settled in U.S. dollars, 60% of the 110 trillion in, in, in banking settlements are collateralized in U.S. dollars. This year in 2023, more than 85% of FX transactions were in U.S. dollars. To Brent's point, the derivatives markets, U.S. dollars, the petrodollar, for now, still U.S. dollars. The euro dollar market, still U.S. dollars. The U.S. dollar is not going anywhere tomorrow. It's not the end of the world reserve currency. To Rick Rule's point, I think that hegemony of the U.S. dollar is changing irrevocably. Once you break trust like they did in 2022, and to your point, Grant, so that was as big a watershed in 2022, Q1, as August of 1971 when we welched on the Bretton Woods gold-backed dollar. So it is slow, algorithmic, and then all at once. But to Brent's point, the U.S. dollars are going anywhere. It's still very important for all the numerical statistical numbers we can give. But I think it is something that you can't also now ignore. And this death by a thousand cuts of the inherent purchasing power of the U.S. dollar began in 1971. The U.S. dollar has lost 98% of its purchasing power when measured against one milligram of gold. Well, that was the year I was born. We're talking 19 cents over 50 years ago. It took a long time. And to your point, Andy, it's going to take a long time for the end of the U.S. dollar as a world reserve currency. But if you had asked someone in the British Parliament in 1890 or 1895 if the British pound sterling would ever not be the global currency, they'd have probably laughed at you in 1890 or 1903. Fast forward World War I, World War II, the loss of Suez. So none of us know what could or will be the tipping point, but we are clearly heading in that direction, but also in all fairness to Brent Johnson and the milkshake theory, there is a massive straw sucking on that U.S. dollar. The one thing, if Brent were here, I'd ask him is, there's not a similar straw for that U.S. Treasury, and that has implications for the U.S. dollar. Brent, are you in the room? You're a celebrity on this panel, buddy. <laughs> <laughs> Don't worry, I'm bringing Brent we'll up him. next on the next panel, so we'll get to hear from him. Uh, okay, so, so a couple things here. Um, you mentioned 1971 and similar activity, or maybe the beginning of this activity. The, the reason it struck me as an interesting point, Matt, is was it different? what's different about today versus the activity we saw in 71 when the world... Mm -hmm. had a super important signal that they should all lose confidence in the U.S. dollar. Yet, mm -hmm. that was the year you were born. Here we are, still in the U.S. hegemony. So now we can say, oh, but this time they sanctioned reserves from Russia. That's a big event. But, but so was that in 71, right? And mm -hmm. so just to bring perspective into this, could we be having this conversation, right? Uh, you know, another 50 years down the road and, and mm -hmm. another event and, and, and essentially repeating. What, what's your take on this time versus that time? It's a very different world, obviously. The, one of the most obvious differences is our debt levels, to your point. 400 billion in 1970, 71, 34 trillion today. Can the OPEC nations really want a gold-backed, I mean, a US dollar, petrodollar? Why would they want that dollar when, when, when 
when we welched on the U.S. dollar having no golden chaperone, what was Kissinger and Nixon doing right away? Trying to strike a petrodollar deal to create synthetic demand for that U.S. dollar because it, now we could print as much as we want. People were worried about it. So we had to make that dollar look more attractive to OPEC, OPEC so that the world would have to buy oil in U.S. dollars. Well, Volcker raised rates by 15%. Real rates were 5 to 8%. They were trying to make that U.S. dollar look viable to the oil producers of the world. Well, now, fast forward 50 plus years, we have $34 trillion in debt. We have way too much um, stress on our U.S. dollar, regardless of what you think of the DXY's future. Powell cannot be Volcker. He can't raise 15% interest rates to make that dollar sexy because Uncle Sam can't afford those interest rates. We've hit that fiscal dominance that Lou Groman talks about. It's a very different world. 50 years of living beyond our means in debt and thinking we can have deficits without tears is a fantasy. And that is why there's less interest in those U.S. treasuries. That's why there's more pressure uh, on a Fed that really is damned if they do, damned if they don't. They're cornered now. They raise rates. They crush everything except the U.S. dollar. They do nothing. They, have, they debase the currency. And we have victory maybe in the S&P, but the inherent purchasing power of our currency gets neutered like a glass of wine with a bucket of water poured in it. Okay, so you mentioned, okay, a couple of things here. So first of all, Grant uh, or, or Andy, feel free to jump in on this one. The, the topic of fiscal dominance, essentially the point where a country has to print money just to make the interest payments on their debt. I mean, that's at a high level, the concept. And, and if, if I'm missing something there, Grant, would you mind filling that in? Well, look, if you take a look at the, the S&P 500 and look how many companies cannot fund operations, cannot, sorry, cannot pay their debt out of their cash flow. They can't pay off their debt. They need lower rates. The U.S. is in a similar boat. They need lower rates. And, uh, you know, as, as Matthew was saying there, at a point where everybody is refusing to buy treasuries, or that's, that's a little too extreme, as, is declining to buy as many treasuries at exactly the point when the U.S. needs to issue more, the pressure there is for higher rates, period. That's just how it works. If people aren't going to buy them, we're going to have to offer them a bigger coupon for them. So that's one of the big differences here. And, and one, one thing I think is important for everybody in this room, you know, this is something about which everybody that invests in markets today needs to have uh, an opinion, but they need to understand what's going on so they can perhaps alter that opinion in terms of timeline. Because I'm pretty sure that everyone in this room that has spent any time thinking about the dollar... Um, has a view about which way it's going to go. Either uh, the dollar's not going anywhere anytime soon and all this talk about competing currencies is complete nonsense, or they're in the camp that says the US dollar's finished, it's just a matter of time. And listening to conversations like this, I'm willing to bet that most people in the room have heard the stuff that goes against what they say and are thinking, yeah, but the dollar's not going away anytime soon. And the people that have a similar opinion to the three of us up here talking are going, yeah, this is exactly what I think. It's really, really important to be able to think critically about this and to understand when things shift in either direction, even slightly, because it can have an outsized effect on your portfolio. So, so betting, betting the farm on the dollar going away, if your time horizon is 100 years, I'm pretty certain that you're going to be right at some point, but none of us really have 100-year time horizons. So please be flexible in how you view this dynamic playing out because it's going to shape and morph and change and to give Brent more props you know if you haven't understood his milkshake theory that's as good a way of explaining what's happening it doesn't give you the timelines because that's impossible but in terms of understanding all the different dynamics of play and the way that these dominoes are going to topple that to me is the gold standard I appreciate that you're Grant. welcome Brent <laughs> wherever you are Andy, you had yeah, real there. quick, you know, first, people need to understand how big these numbers are. Everyone in this room could dream of making a million dollars in a career, and you would if you worked a normal career. A million doesn't sound like a lot. A trillion seconds ago was 31,688 years ago. So the numbers are getting far too large, I think, uh, for, for people really to even comprehend. We have $10 trillion in bonds that come due this year. How the hell do you pay for that? I know, you borrow some more money. And when you talk about what makes the dollar the reserve currency, a lot of it, most of it, has to deal with the fact that oil is denominated in dollars. It's created a synthetic demand. So aside from weaponizing the dollar, we also signed an executive order to go green. And by 2030, we'll be 50% green, supposedly, and by 2050, 
80% green. So ask yourself, put yourself in the position of these countries. You have a currency that is being inflated away. They've chosen inflation over austerity. You can't raise rates, like, like these guys were saying. If you raise rates high enough, like Volcker did, to 18.5%, the stock market, the bond market, the real estate market, and the banking system, poof, they implode, just like that. So. These people understand, look, these are guys that are going green. They've signed an executive order to do so. They've weaponized the dollar. Their bond market has eviscerated us over the last couple of years. They go around the world coercing people. So you can see, instead of clinging to the world reserve status and, and the exorbitant privilege it is, it's almost as if we're doing all we can to create a villain. And that villain would be Xi Jinping and Putin and OPEC who move away all at once at some point. Little by little by little by little, you see all of this being challenged. 20% of oil sales last year were done in currencies other than the dollar. And look at all of the countries striking bilateral deals outside of the dollar. So the numbers are very big. The Fed cannot raise rates high enough. So in a theory where Klaus Schwab says there'll be a great reset, you'll own nothing and you'll be happy. If that really were true, okay, if it were, let's just pretend for a moment it is, well, either the Fed and the Treasury fall on the sword or instead you incentivize the world to move away from the West. You incentivize them through coercion, through sanctioning, through telling them that we're going green, we don't need you anymore. And, 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 and really mismanagement in terms of monetary and fiscal policy. And then they find safety in numbers and then that all at once moment happens. Don't know when it is, but when it is and they say, look, we're thank you for everything, we appreciate it. But you guys are going green. We appreciate the 50 years worth of, uh, of protection, but you got, you got uh, the head of, of uh, the, the, the Saudi crown, crown prince who just said, China it was our most important customer for oil sales this year and for the next 50. Well, those words are important. It's been 50 years that we've been the petrodollar. He's signaling that you know, maybe there's a new player coming in town. So when that all at once moment happens, and the world no longer has to hold dollars and the dollars get dumped, creating a hyperinflationary moment. Interest rates spike to the moon to do the dirty work. Stocks, bonds, real estate, the dollar, the banking system, boom. Now, could be a long ways down the road. Maybe it won't happen. But all I can tell you is that if this, you do it that way, now you have a villain. And it was them who did it to us and then you come in and you reset with your CBDC and even as Kristalina Georgieva, the head of the IMF said, if it's not pegged to something, it's another fiat. What is gold? The only other tier one reserve asset as, as classified by the BIS in 2019. Who bought more gold than any time in history over the last two years? Oh yeah, the central bank. So you can see progression, little by little by little by little, something's gonna change. Don't know when it is, but I'm very confident that we are at the foothills of, of change. How much do you factor in geopolitical considerations into this conversation and therefore into your portfolio? In a minute, I want to get to the real truth teller, which is where you put in your cash, right? That, that's the real truth teller here. Um, I look at the conflicts breaking out around the world um, with a bit more concern because I think about the escalation trajectory and um, how many major players seem to be involved in so many major conflicts right now. We've obviously got the conflict in Russia and the conflicts in the Middle East, but there's very high tension in the South Pacific. Venezuela and Guyana are on a knife's edge. The United States has already said they'll get involved. Uh, Yemen, obviously, etc. What's your opinion on this? Are these wars uh, uh, opportunistic in their timing because the global empire maybe is a bit more fragile than it was 10 years ago and now is the time to strike? Or are they territorial disputes that were going to happen anyways and may accelerate this trend regardless or completely unrelated altogether? And I'll just give it to the panel who wants to take that first. Looks like you're ready, Matt. I, I use this quote all the time from Ernest Hemingway. You know, you, well, first of all, I think you need, to, you need to put the template in play. I think you could take a calendar and a, and a compass and a calculator and look at any time in history from ancient Rome, 1990s Yugoslavia, Weimar, 1780s France, the Ming Dynasty, the 1930s in the US, post-Civil War America, any time. When you get a nation that's over its skis in debt, which America clearly is despite its iconic past, it's a debt-soaked nation, you go from a debt crisis to a market crisis slash financial crisis, which inevitably becomes a currency crisis, and that currency crisis always, without exception, is responded by extreme political centralization from the left or the right. 
every time in history, without exception. We are seeing evidence everywhere of more centralization, from Canada to the EU to the US. I live in all those places, except I don't live in Canada, half time in America, half time in Europe, every conversation, more and more centralization. So geopolitics matter. The petrodollar, the geopolitics there, the war in the Ukraine, the escalation in, in the Middle East, these are all, you can spend 30 to 40 minutes on each of those. But what is a template is clearly more debt desperation, more currency destruction to monetize that debt, because regardless of the DXY or the dollar's relative strength, its inherent strength is weaker and weaker and weaker. But regardless of that, which is an important distinction, the centralization is concerning, the geopolitics are concerning, but the real blame is in the bathroom mirror of our central bankers, not Putin, not COVID, not men from Mars, not all the things that the media wants us to focus on because it's our own central bank policies, our own politicians, North America, South America, Canada, the US, EU, Brussels, that are spending way more than they earn and looking for something else to blame. And that's where Ernest Hemingway had that famous quote, you'll always, when a country goes broke, see political opportunists, Left or right, you decide, whoever you want, just want to pick on, you can pick on Trudeau, you can pick on Biden, you can pick on Trump, whoever you want. You'll see political opportunists buying temporary prosperity by debasing their currency to get political votes or even a Bernanke Nobel Prize in the short term, but permanent ruin through distraction and war. And what do we see right now throughout the world, wherever we travel? More inflation, hidden, misguided, misreported, but felt by everyone in this room and permanent war since I was born, Vietnam to Afghanistan to now proxy wars and who knows what happens in the Middle East, permanent ruin by political opportunists who will not take accountability for failed policies, whether it's weaponizing science during COVID, weaponizing the media, weaponizing the Department of Justice, weaponizing our currency. We live in an era where this is not sensational anymore. I'm the most boring person, but if you study history and math, this is not a gold bug argument from a guy in Switzerland. I made my money speculating. I'm not against it. I'm just trying to preserve myself from these opportunists who are creating permanent ruin in real time. This is not hypothetical to me. I don't have a central bank that's protecting my currency. I have to gold back my own euro, dollar, Swiss franc on my own. And that's not a gold book, you know, bull selling my book. That's common sense in history, far more than risk asset projections or political forecasting, which none of us can really do. Grant, I, I just looked at the clock. Can I give you the closing word here uh, in relation to that last question, factoring in geopolitical risk or anything that Matt just shared? Yeah, I, th I think there's a third uh, option, Jay, uh, the two you gave us, and that is historical cycles. You know, this, we, are, we are at the end of a historical cycle, and uh, you know, anyone in here who's read The Fourth Turning will understand what I'm talking about, and anyone here who hasn't read The Fourth Turning by Neil Howe and Bill Strauss should read it, um, because they go back through history, and they, they demonstrate that these cycles occur over and over again, and they tend to occur just when the generation that remember the last time a debacle like this happened have all died away, and here we are, right? And um, you know, after the, the attacks uh, by Hamas in October, you know, I was watching kids in Paris smashing windows of Jewish delis in broad daylight, Jewish cafes and stuff, and I'm thinking, how the hell did we get here? You know, my father has just come to spend some time with me, he's 85, and I realized he was born in 1939. So my father, who's 85, doesn't remember what brought the Nazis to power before World War II. He doesn't really remember the war. To have any kind of memory of those events, you've got to be over 100. So those memories are gone. And we don't teach that part of history anymore. So we do make the same mistakes over and over again. So whether these wars, you can say they're political opportunism, and they are. People sense that America is weaker, and so they're a bit more brazen. But it's a time thing. America is weaker because we're 100 years into the cycle, the last cycle. We've reached another fourth turning, and fourth turnings are characterized by financial crises and ultimately conflict that purges the system of the loss of trust in institutions, the loss of faith in politicians, the corruption, all the things that we see around us and, and sound like kind of hyperbole, but they're real. We're in the cleansing part of that process. And we will go through that and we will come out to a much better world, but it could take another eight, 10 years. And you have to be ready in those next eight to 10 years for events that you haven't had to think about for your entire lives. Complete outlier possibilities like a land war in Europe, right? Whoever thought that was gonna happen again? There's one going on right now. So 
understand history, you know, Matt, everything Matthew said there is absolutely right, understand history, understand that we just happen to be the ages we are at the period when this is happening. It will happen again in another hundred years. It's just the way it is and we have to just think it through and deal with it and recognize there is a positive outcome but not without going through an awful lot of turmoil.